Yale and Princeton have seen a drop in Asian American students since the ending of admission-based affirmative action, but is it what everybody thinks it is? Let's discuss. Some people are saying that we are model minorities that played into the hands of white supremacy. Other people said there's not enough data to be conclusive. It's confusing. Uh, but let's read the title. Yale, Princeton, C drop in Asian American students after SCOTUS affirmative action ruling. Let's take a look at the chart, Andrew. This is from Yale. So uh, white way back in the day was like really high. It dropped, had a little spike, had a huge drop. But recently for tw the class of 2028, Andrew, it spiked back up. An Asian American took a hit. Right. And then as you can see, the Hispanic, Latino, uh, African American uh, student groups have have increased a little bit. And then international, maybe a slight dip. Native American has stayed the same. So based off of this graph, this very simple graph, only for Yale, this is just Yale University, um, people are kind of questioning like, hey, the Supreme Court ended affirmative uh, admission-based affirmative actions for universities in 2023. Are these the effects of it? Did white jump up and Asian go down? What's going on here? Right, this is being politicized in the comments section, also in the news articles and the interpretation of these statistics. So make sure you like, subscribe, turn on your notifications, check out Smile Assos at smileassos.com. Let me tell you this, Andrew. Here's the harsh truth. Whoa. The data is inconclusive. You know why? why? Because MIT jumped up from 40% to 47%. Harvard had no change, even though Yale and Princeton had a drop in Asian American admissions. So it's not like uniform across elite institutions or Ivy League institutions. Right. So just looking at Yale and Princeton alone and kind of talking about this correlation, causation type thing, it's not clear because the other elite universities did not go through the same thing. Right, and white enrollment was up 4%. A lot of people are assuming that that's either athletes or legacy, right? Because that is the presumption. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because it's kind of a, a, a both a stereotype and a presumption or a, uh, or like an archetype that white kids only get in based off their super rich old money families, right? Right, right. That is a stereotype and that does take away from the hardworking <laughs> and very, you know, smart white students. But sure. Apparently you, there is some stats to back it up. I was looking you, into yeah, it. I mean, I think it's safe to say that most legacy students are probably of white descent. Right, because who else was in America in a privileged position in the, back in the day? There was only white and black people, and certainly it was not black people in the privileged position in American history. Um, number two, Hispanic enrollment's up 2%. Asian enrollment is down 6%. So white and Hispanic is the thing that, like, I guess took the Asian enrollment. And then black enrollment is steady. Mm. Some people said it's because they all went to MIT instead. That's fine. MIT, Andrew, interestingly enough, you know why MIT jumped from 40 to 47%? That, first of all, 47% is very Asian for a school. That's incredibly, that's pretty much at that point, just an Asian. It's an Asian school at this point. I mean, 47, that's the You biggest. might as well just serve dumplings at the cafeteria or noodles or something, right? Yeah. But I'm saying it's because not only did they end affirmative action, they ended legacy as well at MIT. Wow. So like we said, that that's going to hurt the white kids. Ending right, legacy, right? Right. Ending legacy is a good move. Good um, move. Somebody said this is being politicized, way not to report on the increases of Asian Americans at other elite universities. Honestly, that's why that this study's data is inconclusive. Mm. Yeah, and if you look at Harvard, so Harvard actually released its race uh, breakdown for the class of 2028, meaning freshmen this year. And actually, the so for Harvard, the black uh, students... Uh, decreased 4% from 2027, but the Asian American students have seen no change. Right, So right, right. it wasn't between like, oh, these underqualified, like other groups are getting in because, uh, and taking spots of Asians. It's like, well, the Asians stayed the same. And then, you know. No, it reason. looks like at all the schools where affirmative action was uh, went up, Andrew, Latino and white went up. Mm. And Asian either remained unchanged or went down. But in the case of ending legacy, Asian admissions yeah. went up. So my thoughts on the data real quick, my question is like on the Yale chart where, well, let's bring it up, pop up the Yale chart right here. When it says international, I think that's interesting because international, what does that mean? The international is not a race. So it could be international Asians, right? Which you would guess that there's probably a lot of. International but, Indians too. I would right, in, in international Indians, you have, which would count as Asian, uh, if you counted them as in the Asian American. Or what if you're like an international Chinese person from France? 
Ooh. Or what about if you're like, there's yeah, a lot of but Chinese it could be in international Europe. black kids, like international uh, from Nigeria, from uh, 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 South Africa, or from wherever else. You know what I mean? They right. could be ethnically black, but from somewhere else. Right, right, right. I mean, you could be ethnically white and Latino too. You could be from like legacy Spanish families. You know what I mean? That were Mexico living. City. That is very possible. Yes. Right, right, right. Um. Anyway, this somebody on Reddit said this study just shows one of two things. Okay, it either shows that schools like Yale and Princeton found a way to continue affirmative action without legally being able to continue it through like racial essays or just looking at last names, or that black and Latino kids who were getting in weren't taking the boost, weren't getting an extra bump on the test scores, or either way, this is what's leading to the data being politicized. But a lot of people are also saying that Yale for 2028 did not require SAT scores. It was the last year that they uh, stopped requiring it. Okay. Because basically they're bringing the requirement back. Mm. So anyway, I'll say this. This is my interpretation of the data. I do think that there's some, probably some, some Chinese American kids or Asian American kids, but I'm just going to guess that they're Chinese because these, those tend to be the type of families who are like 15 out of 10 taking this, you know, college admissions to this most serious level. I would say there's some kids that probably would have gotten in Andrew, but didn't get in due to like whatever, for whatever reason, maybe they were from upper middle-class families or rich families. Right. But are, aren't you saying, is there data that shows that, they are focusing more on income level because generally most people are like, hey guys, don't think too much about the race of the person. Think more about the background they come from, like income and their parents' education right. level. And that could stuff. still boost up black and Latino enrollment. All right. Look, thinking about the income level. But you know who I was thinking it could hurt is if potentially there was a middle to upper middle class Chinese Southeast Asian. Let's say there's a Chinese person from Cambodia with really high scores. So they're saying that they were getting the affirmative action bump prior for possibly being from an underrepresented Asian group, which is Southeast Asian. And then that designation got taken away and then they got kicked to income group and their family doesn't qualify for the income boost. You're saying you have a hunch that's what happened. I'm just throwing it out there. Mm. So Theory. basically, basically here's my actual takeaway. I don't think that either the right wing trying to politicize this or the hyper left wing interpretation of this data is fully logical because there would be data points that kind of like make it murky on both arguments. Right. So if you cherry pick Yale and Princeton, it seems like it supports the left. Right. It supports. And if you what, cherry pick MIT, it looks like it supports the right. Right. So I guess what I'm saying is it's inconclusive. Ah. So anyway, I, I just want to get into some points about affirmative action here that are uh, pulled from the comment section. These are very intellectual points, Andrew. Do poor kids from disadvantaged backgrounds, broken families, low-income families, do they get enough of a bump? Or should colleges take that heavily into consideration? Because presumably, people from poor backgrounds, I don't care what race you are, you could be a poor white hillbilly. Technically, it was harder for you to even get in the realm of a... Uh, possible acceptance as a kid from a rich private school boarding school background yeah i mean i don't know how much they should weigh it it should just be a factor for sure but i don't think that should define everything either because uh there are ways that you can kind of fudge your numbers as far as your income too so right, of if course if your parents own like cash businesses or something like yeah, that or just under declare i mean i don't know do the college admissions check your bank statements are they the IRS? Do they check with the IRS? How many taxes did right. this Chu family pay because they say that they only had an right. income of 50000 well, I, I don't think the colleges are like checking Swiss bank accounts. They're more looking for family connections and family connections into the old money power circles of America would indicate that you, you have a high net worth. Sure. Um, this guy quantitatively, by the way, guys, he just said it on Reddit. He said that poor students that are from a very poor background get a 1.25 multiplier, but he said that the rich, ultra rich kids that are like part of the global elite get a 2.0 multiplier mm. in terms of their, uh, what is their, their raw, like accepted yeah. score? I mean, I don't know. Is it like, like we said, how wrong is it that elite colleges value not just all colleges, I'm saying elite colleges value these potentially legacy students or these students, right. these elite students from great, great background. Because they, these are private universities, Harvard, they value their legacy. No, the and old want, money elite, the people who like puppet, are the puppet masters of the world, Yes, right? they want the kids of the powerful families. It's true. And 
as a private university, are they entitled to do that for themselves? Now, I don't think UC Berkeley should do that. I don't think... And that's why Berkeley is super Asian. Yeah, and that Berkeley super Asian, because they really don't take into account that. Probably a little bit still, but not a lot. And I'm like, so I guess like, that's another question is, is it wrong for elite universities to value that a little bit? Right. Uh, I mean, I think you could make arguments both ways quite logically. Point number two, Andrew, if public schools are based on property taxes, aren't public schools just doomed to be bad? So basically people are saying like, the way the public schools are funded in America, it's funded by that locality's property taxes. So you live in an area where I guess it's lower income. There's not a lot of property taxes. That public, those public schools in low income areas are destined to be bad and have low resources and not get the best teachers and mm. not have programs. I don't know. I mean, I, I think sports make a lot of money for the for the college, and there's a way the colleges make money. Like you would guess, okay. Uh, University of Alabama, which Alabama doesn't, is not like no, they're the talking high about high schools. So they're saying that the kids are from bad public schools are screwed to try oh. to get into elite colleges because they're probably from an area that's funded with low property taxes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I guess but that's, that's why they should definitely have access to easy scholarships to like the state university. Right, and then this gets into charter schools and magnet schools and all yeah. these different like No, like in and- our school district, we had one school, one high school that had a special Bill Gates scholarship. But no, it was at the worst high school. Yeah, that it was at the worst 50. high school. We, we had a school in our district that had a way below 50% graduation rate. Yeah, and kids from that school were granted no other school in our district, no other, not my high school, it, we did not have that Bill Gates scholarship available at our school. Only this one school out of the four high schools was the worst one. So right, right, right. Point number three, kids need to be challenged by the best, just like sports. They were saying that this is another disadvantage of people being put in bad schools is because even the smart kids will never get to realize their potential because they're around, you know, it's not like a, if a school's not hyper academically focused, then you got a lot of kids in your class that don't really care. So it's easy for you to not challenge Wait, are yourself. they talking about high schools they're talking or about high colleges? Schools. High schools. Point number four, somebody said, why is this such a big deal? Asians make up 7% of the population, but they dropped from 30% of Yale's freshman class admissions to 24%. Who cares? They're still way over-indexed. And then somebody else said, yeah, but isn't that messed up to take a look at a race that's over-indexing at something? For example, if you look at the Olympics 100-meter race, every single country is almost represented by a black athlete, whether that country is black or not. What if they capped the 100-meter race at the Olympics for uh, black athletes? Yeah, sports and academics, comparing the two. Um, which, which you hear a lot, right? Because the NBA is not capped. The NFL is not uh, capped. And then white sports like hockey that are like obviously overwhelmingly white, that's not Yeah, I, obviously I think the argument for academic institutions is that they should be less capped. You say that academics based, are not like sports. Yeah, because sports is for entertainment. So I guess whatever brings in the most money for that sport you should feel free to do. But when it comes to academics, it should be less capped. So so then if if a school is going to be 50% Asian, so be it. Right. I mean, it's tough to say, right? I guess the way MIT is running it is more like a sport. Right, right. But then there is like, you know, I understand that you do, there should be some diversity initiatives as well. So there's always this balance. Right. Point number five, Andrew, a lot of people are saying that Yale and Princeton may have still been doing their own version of uh, internal affirmative action, even though it was outlawed by SCOTUS. And then point number six, this was the largest argument I saw, because obviously, like I said, when you look on the internet, guys, these internets, they sort of like deviate and they like spiral into these arguments that are like tree branches that are like not fully related to the trunk of the tree. But it said, black Americans came as slaves, not because they decided to immigrate. The rest of you made a decision to move to the US, which was built by whites and black slavery, but the latter never truly benefited. What's wrong with people from a more uh, disadvantaged background, historically disadvantaged background in America getting a test score bump. I do think that that is a good argument against why the, like, I do think that Asian Americans should take some of American history into consideration. And I don't think that, for example, Andrew Harrison Chen, the guy who had really high test scores but got denied from all the Ivy League universities and had a lawsuit, I don't think he's taking that into consideration, but he might just be thinking about his life within the realm of his of himself. Mm-hmm. So 
I don't know. I mean, this is really interesting. Like, this is getting into the political analysis and the should all minorities stick together against white supremacy or are we all siloed out into our own individual situations? Mm -hmm. So anyway, let's take a look at the reaction from the Asian American community. That was a good transition comment. Somebody said, right wing Asians will be our own biggest problem. No, it's the liberal boba Asians that will be our downfall. Andrew, guess what? Arguing politicization of this Yale Princeton MIT situation on both sides. Mm -hmm. Um, does it surprise you? Yes or no? No. I mean, uh, other people here, we just got more arguing. We got more arguing between liberal Asians and conservative Asians. This guy said it didn't benefit Southeast Asians anyway, so this is a loss only for East Asians. Basically saying that the East Asians are the more white adjacent, potentially, and the East Asians are the ones that are in between white legacies and black and Latino affirmative action mm. applicants. I'll say this. Uh, yes and no. I think that, you know, I don't think that there's a huge applicant pool from Southeast Asians that are applying to Harvard and stuff like that or Yale or Princeton. But I think it's like um, it could impact them because I don't know where they're listed in affirmative action. Right. Like, are they like segmenting Asians out by like country of origin or like refugee, non-refugee? I do think it's complicated. Um, somebody said, why don't Asians go build our own historically Asian colleges and universities since we're getting discriminated against? And then someone said, yeah, but I guess you could argue Stanford, Berkeley, UCLA, and MIT are already Asian universities. Right, right, right. Because it seems like most Asians want to be in California where the Asian American culture is very strong, right? Um, and then this last comment was more of a pro-Asian comment saying, why do Asians always have to apologize for looking after Asian interests? Because this guy was saying that the Asians that were against affirmative action were just trying to be pro-Asian, not be pro-white supremacist, even though that's how other people took it. Right. Right. I mean, I've, I feel like there's a general sentiment from, uh, from what I see the comments from certain black people or like other Asians who are like, ah, Asians played themselves. You guys ended affirmative action and look, the numbers are going down. And, and then again, the white people benefited, right? Yeah. And again, like those are just two universities and there's not enough data. We're not really going to know for another five years, honestly. Right. We have to have this play out. And yeah, I think it was an emotional uh, issue for a lot of Asian parents or uh, incoming Asian students who thought that they were going to get, uh, denied. Well, specifically, Asian. Andrew, let's be honest, from the more tiger mom model minority families that pretty much make it the primary focus of life. Yeah. I, yeah, I just, I don't know. For me, I can't, I'm not going to get emotional about this because it's only so early on. And there are some schools that became more Asian. There's some schools that became a little bit less Asian. Uh, so ultimately, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Like, what else can you say other than I think there are signs that point to, yeah, it wasn't like Asians versus black people. That, that's not the case. That was not really the case. Right, right, right. And, and it could have been always just, uh, it's almost like more like a, a melee battle. I don't even know if it's a battle. It's just, I think a lot more complicated. I think you have to look at geopolitical relations with China may have gotten worse. That lessened the amount of international students coming in from China, which affects the international student stats as well as the Asian American student stats. It also like... Uh, uh, you have to take a look at STEM programs. Yale and Princeton are more known for social sciences rather than STEM. If you look at Asians, they tend to go towards STEM or STEAM. That's more MIT centric. And I will say this. I don't think this is my primary concern because I do think a lot of more hyper academic upper middle class to wealthy Asian families care the most about this. And I'm not saying that it's not a concern because it does impact Asians, but I, I see low, lower income Asian families being killed or robbed in low income neighborhoods, that seems like, I, I get it that that's a completely unrelated issue, but it also seems like a also rather important issue mm. to care about. So that's why I, I can't put all my thinking into this, but obviously somebody who's like, that's the sole focus of their life. Their priorities are different than somebody else's then living a completely different life. Anyway, guys, let us know what you think in the, in the comment section below. How is this data being interpreted? Is there inconclusive data? Does there need to be more? And of course, like we said, it's 2024. It's an election season. So everybody's jumping to a politicized sort of end to it. Let us know what you think in the comment section below. Until next time, we the Hot Pot Boys. We out. Peace. Peace.